Hello, and thanks for joining us today for the latest Technology Networks webinar, Development of IPSCs from Reprogramming to Functional Assessment. I'm Alexander Beadle, Science Writer for Technology Networks, and I'm here to moderate this event. I'm pleased to have Dr. Jessica Hartman and Dr. Ali Yehia joining us today as your presenters. A warm welcome to you both. Jessica has a PhD from Duke University in Molecular Cancer Biology and postdoctoral training in biochemistry and cancer biology at Baylor College of Medicine and Duke University, respectively. She has previously served in director level roles, managing bioscience research and development for biotechnology companies. At Cell Microsystems, Dr. Hartman's role is to lead the development of new and streamlined workflows using Cell RAF technology and its associated products. Ali has a PhD in cardiac electrophysiology from McGill University. He has been involved in ion channel screening using Automate Patch Clamp since 2006. He worked at Sophion as an application scientist and later became the director of sales for North America. He then joined Fluxion Biosciences in 2012, where he developed ion channel assays and ion flux mercury systems. He was the chief scientific officer at Fluxion before moving on to Cell Microsystems as the new senior director of the Ion Flux product. Following this webinar, we will have a Q&A session and we welcome any questions that you may have. You can submit a question for the Q&A session at any time during the presentation. To ask a question, you should enter your question into the box on the right hand side of your screen and click send. We will answer as many questions as we can during the time we have available. For any questions that we don't have time to get to, we will make sure that you are contacted offline with an answer. If you experience any technical issues, please click the chat icon in the bottom right corner to request support. Please remember you can ask questions at any time, even whilst watching the webinar on demand. So without further ado, I will now hand over to Jessica and Ali. Thank you, Alex, for that kind introduction. Uh, my colleague Ali and I are so happy to join you today to talk to you about the development of IPSCs from reprogramming to functional assessment and how we've been using novel technologies to improve the automation and the scalability of these types of workflows. Now, if you're joining us today, you're probably as excited about induced pluripotent stem cells as we are. And hopefully by the end of today's webinar, you'll have taken away some key learning objectives that we're going to focus on today. The first of which are some common methodologies for somatic cell reprogramming and how to improve your results when reprogramming cells into iPSCs. My colleague Ali is gonna focus on how ion channels are expressed, modulated, and mutated in different cell types and disorders, and ultimately how we can leverage iPSCs as viable alternatives to animal models to study ion channel disorders in vivo and in vitro. Now, iPSCs, particularly patient-derived, have received a lot of press in recent years for their therapeutic potential, for their ability to have a lot of promise in the clinic. And this is largely because you can derive these patient-derived iPSCs from any cell type in the body that's already been differentiated, known as a somatic cell. And they overcome a lot of the ethical and sourcing issues that are associated with other stem cell types like embryonic stem cells. The starting material for these types of workflows is usually ready available. You can get them from patients or from uh, other in vitro models. And you can take these differentiated cells in a dish. You can use typical reprogramming factors and return them to a more primordial pluripotent stem cell-like state, which gives them the capability of differentiating into any tissue type in the body uh, once you have finished reprogramming them. For some examples here on the slide, you see blood, brain, and heart. And today, Ali and I are primarily gonna focus on the heart and the brain as our models. Once you've differentiated your iPSCs into the functional differentiated cell type of choice, those cells can then be introduced to a patient for a therapeutic benefit. And indeed, current clinical trials for stem cell-derived therapeutics are achieving a lot of attention uh, in the clinic. As you can see here in this cartoon, there are clinical trials ongoing for basically every tissue type in the body trying to leverage these stem cell therapeutics. Uh, and as you can see in the top two bars here, uh, the nervous system and the circulatory system, there's quite a few trials associated with these. And again, uh, we're going to see some data today from me and Ali that focuses on these two tissue types. Now, this Before we continue with this presentation, we will be conducting a short poll which will appear on your screen. Please select the answer that is most relevant to you. 
We appreciate your responses. What method do you currently use for IPS cell line development? A, limiting dilution, B, FACS, C, droplet dispensing, D, clone picker, or E, other? Thank you for your responses. We will now continue with the presentation. Now, despite the promise of these therapeutic IPSC workflows, they are not trivial. And to go from a differentiated cell to a reprogrammed pluripotent stem cell and back to a differentiated cell type requires a lot of time, energy, and effort on the part of the lab. And as you can see here in this schematic, uh, we polled stem cell researchers across the country to see what their biggest pain points were in developing IPSCs for therapeutic effect. As you can see in the graph, the top two answers are it's a highly inefficient process and it takes a tremendous amount of time with those two answers being the vast majority of the pain points associated with IPSCs. Some other issues include the lack of material, excessive use of media, the cost, as well as the lack of guarantee of clonality for those specific cells. And so when I saw these results, I felt like they had been plucked from my own head because this is exactly what I feel like in the lab. And it reminded me of those old commercials where four out of five dentists agree. Um, so clearly here, four out of five stem cell biologists agree as well. Of course, there is that one lone scientist out there who really loves to do things the, the, the most manual, difficult way possible. But in my lab and in most of your labs as well, I'm sure you're looking for ways to make this process easier, faster, better, so that you can actually help the patients that you're trying to help uh, in the clinic and beyond. The, the reason this is so inefficient and laborious is largely because you're starting from a cell that already thinks it's one thing and you are trying to force it back along a pathway that it long said goodbye to uh, after it differentiated into a, uh, a normal cell type of its choice. The way that we do this in the lab has become fairly uh, accessible for the majority of researchers, largely because there are a variety of kits available to you. These are mostly integration free because we want to create a stem cell population that's as native as possible with as few perturbations so that we don't have any downstream clinical effects like cancer uh, or other off target effects. All of these kits start with the idea that you're going to be putting in these reprogramming factors back into this differentiated cell type via some methodology of electroporation or infection. And the three most common examples are listed here in this table. There are RNA based methods episomal vector-based methods and Sendai-based virus methods that allow you to put these reprogramming factors in, return those cells to a proliferative state, and then characterize them further downstream. But what's immediately obvious in this table are those three red circles that you see listed here. The efficiency of each of these processes is incredibly low, ranging from 0.04% to slightly greater than 1% for the Sendai virus, which means that if I'm in my lab trying to do this, I'm screening hundreds to thousands of potential colonies in order to find just one that matches what I actually need it to do. Not to mention the fact this process is going to take anywhere from 30 to 60 days to complete end to end if you're lucky. And if you're not, you're going to have to start all over again and do it all over. And you might have to repeat this because maybe your cells aren't clonal. Maybe you do all of this characterization and you realize your pluripotent cells aren't capable of differentiating, or even worse, that they have some genetic abnormality that's going to send you back to start and trying all over again. In addition to the efficiency of this process, once you've even achieved reprogramming and gotten those vectors into your fibroblast of choice or your somatic cell of choice, the next step for you in the lab is to do a manual reprogramming workflow. Uh, once you have those reprogrammed cells, the only way to get them out of that dish is by hand. I've sat in the lab, looked down a microscope at a very intimidating dish of cells and thought to myself, how on earth are these precious cells going to get into a dish to become my IPOCs? And that's because what you see here in the bright field is a lawn of unreprogrammed cells surrounding your precious IPSC putative colonies. You as the researcher then have to go in there with a needle and dissect out that colony. Uh, when I've tried this in the past, you end up with this sort of bear claw looking thing where you have manually dissected out your colony, 
gone in there with a P200, aspirated the pieces of your sample and injected them into a 96 well plate. This process is highly subjective, very labor intensive, and almost always requires an expert user who knows what they're doing. And even for the best researchers who know exactly what they're doing, it typically takes between an hour and three hours to fill a single 96 well plate. At the end of that three hour process, you walk away from the lab and you hope that your cells are growing in that collection plate. But more often than not, when you look down into the microscope a few days later, what you see are colonies that look either prematurely differentiated and have not maintained that pluripotency, or even worse, empty wells full of dead and dying cells. So what we wanted to investigate was whether or not this process of reprogramming could actually be automated and standardized across operators in order to increase the scale and reduce those pain points in the lab for your research staff. So what you can see here are the two different approaches that we took. We wanted to compare the traditional method to the cell raft air technology, which is a novel technology that I'm going to tell you a little bit about now. The best part about the cell raft technology is that there's no more scraping or pruning of colonies with a 27 gauge needle ever again. The whole process happens very hands-free, it's fully automated and preserves the integrity of your precious samples. And that's largely because of the consumable that we use, which is the cell raft array. It is a novel plastic-like culture dish that allows you to culture all of your reprogrammed cells in the same media while enabling spatial segregation of your growing clones. We can use the tools provided with the technology, the cell raft cytometry software and the cell raft air system in order to perform image-based and software-guided selection of putative reprogrammed colonies that we're interested in. And once we find those colonies, we're able to automatically transfer them to that collection plate without any scraping or dissociation. And we can grow our cells passively off of the raft in our 96 well plate. To explain a little bit more of the benefits of the technology and why this consumable actually is really beneficial for stem cell workflows, uh, here's a cartoon that gives you a little bit more information on the cell raft array itself. As I mentioned before, it's an innovative culture plate. You seed your electroporated or your infected cells directly on the consumable in a contiguous media volume. Those cells settle passively into uh, formed microwells within that gold area that you see here in the top left. There are thousands of microwells in the consumable, and within each microwell is fabricated a microscale growth surface that's called a cell raft. The cell raft is made of polystyrene that can be coated with whatever ECM you're using for your workflow. And importantly, as you'll see later, that cell raft is fully releasable from the array when we're ready to retrieve our cells or colonies of interest. So as you can see in this cartoon, once you've seeded your cells into the array, they settle passively, they'll attach to that polystyrene cell raft, and they'll share a contiguous media volume, which ultimately conditions the media and improves overall success and viability of basically any cell type that you're working with. Now, we had previously used this technology to improve our growth of already established IPSC lines, and I think it helps to anchor the point here of why it's also beneficial for the reprogramming workflow as well. So in this particular experiment, what we did was wanting to compare the benefits of isolating already established colonies as compared to your typical workflow of isolating single cells. In most stem cell workflows, you're going to seed cells by limiting dilution or flow cytometry of a single cell. And that single cell has a really high bar to overcome to recreate that whole population and form a colony. As you can see here in the bar graph, when we used this cell line in limiting dilution, about 10% of the wells actually gave us a colony that was viable that we could use. When we isolate a single IPSC shown here at day one off of the air system, you can see our efficiency is roughly identical to limiting dilution, largely for the reasons that you probably already know. A single cell in a well is going to have a very hard time forming a colony that's successful. However, if we even wait an extra 24 hours before isolating those IPSCs, so this is a day later, uh, our outgrowth, efficiently, outgrowth efficiency doubles to about 28%. If we wait another 24 hours and we isolate on day three, the isolation efficiency and outgrowth efficiency rockets up to 87%. And if we actually isolate a fully formed colony at day six, our outgrowth efficiency goes up to almost 100% of what we isolate forms a viable clone. You can see that here, the raft has been transferred to its collection plate, 
And in only eight days, we've gone from a single IPSC to a beautiful colony that has tight borders, the right morphology, and is growing well in the collection plate. So this data really underscores the importance of growing cells as a unit, as a, as a population, rather than trying to isolate single cells. And again, this is going to have a lot of relevance to the reprogramming workflow as well. So to orient you to the experimental design for what we did in the lab, <clears throat> we actually wanted to directly compare the traditional workflow to the cell rafts technology workflow. And to do so, we leveraged the epizomal reprogramming kit to turn fibroblasts into pluripotent stem cells. In both workflows, we started from a population of 100,000 fibroblasts that were electroporated with the epi kit. In the traditional workflow, we seeded those 100,000 cells in one well of a six well plate, let them grow for 15 days, performed live TRA-160 staining for pluripotency, followed them manually over the course of those 15 days using a microscope, picked them manually, and then did post-isolation expansion for polyclonal lines, and then created monoclonal cell lines for characterization downstream. In contrast, in the cell ref technology workflow, we took those 100,000 cells that were electroporated, seeded them directly after electroporation onto the cell raft array, waited those same 15 days, However, the monitoring was all done on platform. So on that instrument that you see there in the blue, we were able to do automatic scans every 15 days, I mean, every day for 15 days to follow the generation of those reprogrammed cells. And on day 15, we performed TRA-160 staining on the dish to look for reprogrammed clones. Post-isolation expansion and colony formation and clonal generation were all done on another array. And in both cases, both traditional and the cell raft array workflow, we expanded those lines and characterized them using canonical IPOC uh, techniques, including morphology, pluripotency assessment, differentiation, and karyotyping. So the first thing that was abundantly clear when we compared the two workflows was the scale at which we were able to um, upregulate this workflow. As you can see in the top two panels in the six well plate, you see that lawn of unreprogrammed cells surrounding your colonies here are the dark clones that are in fact TRA-160 positive for pluripotency. In contrast on the cell raft array, you can see those individually segregated cell rafts within each microwell. And despite the fact that there are cells in each of those individual microwells, TRA-160 staining demonstrates that in this particular field of view, there's one beautiful pluripotent colony uh, that you would potentially be interested in recovering and expanding. Uh, unfortunately, I, I made the, the core lab folks actually quantitate this experiment, which they did quite painstakingly, and they went into both the six well plate and the cell raft array, and they actually manually counted all of those TRA-160 colonies to directly compare the two different workflows. As you can see in the bar graph on the right, comparing that one cell raft array to one well of a six well plate, we had over twice as many TRA-160 positive colonies compared to the traditional workflow. Um, even having 600 potential uh, clones within the six well plate would be completely intimidating to any researcher looking down the microscope. It would strike fear into any reasonable scientist's heart trying to dissect that many clones out of a single six well plate. In contrast, we have 1,100 individually segregated cell rafts containing pluripotent colonies that could potentially be utilized for downstream workflows fully automated. So in the previous slide, we were looking at a field of view in both cases, uh, the field of view in the six well plate and a field of view on the array. But the amazing thing about the cell raft array and the cell raft air system is that we have the ability to take an unprecedented look into the array over time to see exactly which cells gave us the colonies that we're looking at at the end. If you've ever manually screened uh, pluripotent colonies in a six well dish or in a, a six well plate, you know that you're looking mostly for the end point. You have no idea the starting point of what that eventual colony came from. In contrast, because we can do the uh, automated scanning of the cell raft array on the instrument every single day, we have a complete track and trace data record of that reprogrammed colony from beginning to end. You can see two examples of that here on the left-hand side of your screen. The epizomal reprogramming kit here, you can see on the top uh, image, we have an example of a monoclonal reprogrammed colony. At day one, we see that one individual fibroblast. 
we can follow its growth over that 15 day period. And indeed on day 15, when we stain for trial 160, the entire colony is uniformly positive for trial 160. Uh, now, if you've ever tried to derive a monoclonal IPSC stable cell line, you know that this process typically takes 30 to 60 days. In only 15 days, we've gone directly from electroporation to clonal confirmation that that particular raft has a high probability of being clonal, shortening our workflow and enabling us to move much faster in the lab. On the flip side, of course, some rafts are also going to contain polyclonal populations, and you can see an example of that below in the green. Uh, that raft contains only a small foci of reprogrammed cells at day 15, but of course that's still a completely viable option in the lab if that's something that you either needed, a polyclonal line, or you could use that polyclonal population and perform subsequent cloning steps on platform later on to clean it up. On the right-hand side of the screen, you can see uh, Ascendi virus reprogramming, a couple of example rafts here, uh, where the, again, all of those cells are in fact positive for trial 160 and would be great candidates for isolation and recovery and further downstream characterization. So using the cell raft array, we're able to get a complete data record of our colony from beginning to end. We're able to confirm morphology and pluripotency and have a high degree of confidence moving forward that those cells are going to make a cell line that we can actually use further down the road. So, of course, at this point, I've only shown you a couple of rafts at a time, but what really strikes me about the cell raft array is that it provides in the lab an unprecedented scale. Um, if you're intimidated by looking down at a plate and seeing hundreds of colonies that you have to manually pick by hand, the air system and the array really enable you to work at a scale that that manual workflow is not going to let you do. So even though we've only looked at a small subset of the array in the previous slides, I thought it was worth showing exactly what it looks like if you zoom in on the array itself. So within one single cell raft array, this is what you're gonna see after reprogramming. So this is a stitched together image of every cell raft within that array that contains a TRA-160 positive cell raft. This is over 10,000 rafts and potentially thousands of reprogrammed colonies that you have at your fingertips to create those downstream cell lines. Now, if you're like me in the lab, that sounds great. I, I love looking at this, but I certainly don't wanna do it by myself. And I certainly don't want to look at all of these images by myself and figure out which of the rafts I actually care about. And that's where the software really comes in to be your best friend in the lab. It allows us to perform software guided colony selection across the entire time course of the array, as well as across any marker expression that we have, size or morphology that might be illustrative to us in raft selection. So cell raft cytometry lets us look for time points. Uh, so for example, we're interested in monoclonal reprogrammed colonies. We can use the software to identify single cells on a given raft. We can also monitor those rafts for growth over time. So for example, confluence or growth rates can be monitored to help us select ones that are growing at rates that we like. And if we're using fluorescence like TRA-160 as a marker, we can also use fluorescence to help us ultimately identify exactly those rafts that contain reprogrammed clones that we're interested in. After the software is used for this type of analytics, it allows you to easily map those cell rafts for isolation on the air system. So when I say isolation, what do I actually mean? I've told you over and over again that you don't have to do this manually and the air system allows you to do it automated. And that's really where the magic of the air system comes in. Uh, the instrument shown here is going to let you retrieve all of those colonies without ever picking up a 27 gauge needle again. Uh, to use the air system, you simply put that array on the left-hand side of the deck and your collection plate that's been pre-coded and pre-filled with your media of choice and you get ready to actually isolate your, uh, your reprogrammed colonies for your downstream workflows. So to show you the principle of what this actually is doing on the air system, we take that array with the rafts that we've identified for retrieval. The air system will automatically identify that position that you've designated for recovery. A needle positioned below the array will actuate through the flexible bottom of the array to poke out that cell raft. The wand dips into the fluid, picks up your raft, and transfers it over to a collection plate for deposit. The reason this whole thing works is because each of those cell rafts has been doped with iron nanoparticles, rendering the rafts removable with that magnetic wand. So as you can see as the video plays, the magnetic wand dips into the fluid, retrieves that raft by magnets, moves it over to the collection plate, and then safely deposits it into your 96-well prefilled collection plate.
Now, what don't you see here? No fluidics, no scraping, no enzymatic dissociation. This whole process happens entirely gently, perturbation-free, improving your outgrowth and success rate because your cells remain attached to the array the entire time, and you don't actually have to disrupt them to move them over to the collection plate. Once you've actually transferred that raft over, uh, this is what happens in the collection plate. You can see here the raft containing your cells of interest is in the 96 well collection plate. This is a time-lapse movie. These aren't IPOCs. Uh, but you can watch the cells actually passively walk off the raft. Again, enzymatic-free, manipulation-free, no perturbations necessary. So automated cell raft transfer, manipulation-free outgrowth means that those cells that we actually have spent all of those weeks babying are going to live on the other side of that isolation and transfer. You can see an example of that here. Uh, this is an example of a transferred reprogrammed colony shown here. This is immediately after isolation. The cells are still attached to the raft. They're still pluripotent by TRI-160 staining, and the cells are viable and will ultimately grow off raft to form that colony that you've worked so hard for. To prove the point, we wanted to make some of these reprogrammed IPSCs into monoclonal cell lines. So we took that reprogrammed polyclonal population, we, we made uh, monoclonal colonies from the expanded lines. And you can see one example of this here. At day one, that blue arrow is pointing to a single uh, reprogrammed IPSC on the raft. You can watch it grow over the course of several days. And then after transfer to the collection plate, we see a beautiful outgrown IPSC colony, nice tight borders, no differentiation, high nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio. Now, a hallmark of any person doing IPSCs is that you have to prove that they're actually pluripotent. And the way that we do this is by trilineage differentiation. So we took these monoclonal colonies that we grew out off of the platform and we performed differentiation of the lines to show that they were in fact pluripotent. This was using the stem diff trilineage differentiation kit from stem cell technologies. And you can see here in both the bright field and the fluorescent imaging that we're able to derive high quality viable monoclonal IPOCs that maintain their pluripotency and were in fact able to differentiate into those three different lineages. And you can see that both by the morphology for endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm, as well as by canonical marker staining, CXCR4 for endoderm, uh, NCAM for mesoderm and CD133 for ectoderm. We also wanted to prove that the lines that we had generated were genetically stable. And so to do so, we used a genetic analysis kit to look for the nine most common abnormalities after IPSC reprogramming. And as you can see here, two of the lines that we generated uh, were in fact genetically stable compared to the normal controls shown in the orange bar, suggesting that the lines that we derived were in fact viable, stable, and genetically normal. <clears throat> So to sum up the data that I've shown you so far, uh, not only has the cell raft technology been able to automate and streamline and improve the scale of the reprogramming workflow, it also dramatically shortens the developmental timelines to actually get to this point where you're doing functional assessment. In the traditional workflow, this whole process took us well over 60 days for the lines to grow up and be able to be substantial enough to be characterized. In contrast, all that data I just showed you from plating to characterization on the air system happened in about 30 days. So in about half the time, we're able to generate a substantial amount of colonies that can then be interrogated for functional assessment. To really put this into context in terms of the number, um, what I like to say is that this workflow really gives you an increased output from a reduced input. As I mentioned earlier, we started from the exact same number of cells in both of these workflows, 100,000 cells. However, we were able to achieve two times the amount of reprogrammed foci in the cell raft array workflow compared to the traditional workflow. We're able to screen over 150 times the number of IPSCs in a single array compared to a traditional limiting dilution workflow in 96 full plates. We were able to identify over 300 clones on a cell raft compared to one putative colony in the limiting dilution workflow. And we were able to characterize those cells up to a month sooner uh, than the traditional workflow, which also led to a reduction in time, energy, effort, materials, labor, and overall improved uh, lab happiness compared to that traditional manual workflow. Now, importantly, I want to highlight here that the air system and the cell raft technology, while I've really focused on reprogramming as the start of this workflow, you can leverage the same technology for basically any part of the IPSC workflow that you might be interested in, whether it's reprogramming, editing and expanding lines of interest, differentiation in 2 or 3D, as well as further characterization of your cells. And so today I'm going to just tell you two quick stories 
about how we've used these IPSC lines after reprogramming in order to um, expand our ability to interrogate them downstream. In the first example, I'm going to tell you a story about how we edited and differentiated patient-derived human IPSCs. Uh, this is in collaboration with a lab at North Carolina State University. They were trying to use CRISPR-Cas9 to knock in GFP as a reporter for their target gene expression. Uh, they came to us because they had already attempted several low pressure droplet dispensing methodologies, flow cytometry, and manual methods, and had been unable to derive a properly edited IPSC cell line because the cells ultimately died. So they came to our lab and brought their cells and their material over to us. Uh, in our lab, we actually electroporated that CRISPR-Cas9 directly into their patient-derived IPSC, seated directly onto the cell raft array. As you can see in the bottom, we were able to identify and expand polyclonal cell wraps for pool expansion to identify pools that were positive for the edit. And then the researcher performed GDNA PCR on those polyclonal populations to confirm which of the lines were actually positive for the edit of interest. And as you can see here in the PCR on the right hand side, two of the lines that we provided were in fact positive for the edit of choice. They then returned those polyclonal lines back to us and we used the air system and the cell raft array to derive monoclonals from those polyclonal population. So we took the polyclonal lines, seeded them as single cells on the cell raft array, we isolated monoclonal colonies into 96 well collection plates and then expanded those clones for downstream analysis. Um, we provided those colonies to the researcher and she performed PCR as well as functional assessment to confirm the edit. As you can see on the left hand side here, there's that single cell at day zero, forms a beautiful colony and by day, day eight, we have a really lovely IPSC clone. And after functional assessment of these, we determined that we'd achieved 17 edited monoclonal cell lines using the cell raft array that were correct for her edit of choice. She was then able to take three of those lines and expand them to confirm expression of GFP by QRT-PCR, and then took those cells and actually differentiated them into functional forebrain neurons in a dish for her actual functional assessment. So in a little over a month or so, we were able to generate uh, dozens of correctly edited IPSC cells that retain both pluripotency, have the edit, and are able to be functionally used downstream for her workflows. Now, what if you're one of those people who's really interested in going beyond the second dimension and wants to look into the third dimension? Well, the air system can also help you grow your organoids uh, in 3D using these edited IPSC-derived lines. Uh, so what I'm showing you here is a field of view of the cell raft array that's been seeded with uh, two different edited IPSC lines, one GFP positive in green, one RFP positive in red. And what you can see here is the formation of clonal IPSC organoids that are either GFP positive, RFP positive, or in fact are chimeras that have formed from an, a red and a green cell forming an organoid uh, in the cell raft. As I've already highlighted, we can zoom in on those rafts over time and we can prove that they are in fact clonal and we can monitor the formation of those two different edited organoids over the course of growth on the array. And you can see here at day one to day seven, the fully red organoid, the fully green organoid and that chimeric organoid, allowing us to perform very uh, discrete phenotypic selection depending on what we're actually looking for in our downstream applications. Now, the other cool thing that we can do on the array is actually differentiate those organoids into whatever target tissue that we care about, both on and off the array. And this is an example of how we've done that in my lab. As you can see, that same green IPSC cell line has been grown on the array uh, for embryoid body formation out to about day five. We can then use the stem diff cerebral organoid differentiation kit to perform neural induction and expansion on array out to about day 10. After day 10, we can perform uh, morphologic and phenotypic selection to determine which rafts contain organoids of interest. And we can then plate them uh, out into a 96 well plate for isolation where they can be continuing to grow and mature in the differentiation media over time. And what you're seeing down below is an example of a cerebral organoid that's forming functional neurites and continuing to grow out to day 37 in the collection plate. And we've cultured these out to two months with uh, viability and efficacy. Now, this is my favorite part uh, because we can turn that differentiated organoid into an entire plate of organoids. 
If you've ever tried to use 3D screening for drug discovery or functional assessment, you know that these types of assays are plagued by inconsistency, lack of reproducibility, or inability to derive an EC50 because you can't get that reproducibility. We're able to use the CellRAF technology with those edited IPSCs to custom design our assay plates based off of size, phenotype, marker expression, whatever we're interested in, and create a full 96 volt plate containing organoids that can then be used downstream for differentiation and functional screening, whether it's drug discovery or therapeutics, et cetera. So again, before we continue the presentation, we would appreciate your responses to a short poll that will appear on screen. Please select the answer that is most relevant to you. Are you interested in learning more about CellRAF technology? A, yes, B, no. Thank you for your responses. We will now continue with the presentation. So hopefully in this section of the talk, I have convinced you that uh, those biggest pain points in your IPSC workflows don't have to stop your science from advancing and using novel technologies that improve automation and scalability can really help you move faster, do more and achieve your end game in the lab. And that the CellRAF technology is able to improve efficiency and reduce time, as well as give you the clones that you want with less effort, less money and less time. So with that, I'm going to turn the talk over to my colleague, Ali, who's going to talk to you about how you actually assess those IPSCs for function once you've gone through all of that energy and effort to make the lines that you have determined are useful uh, for your next steps. Thank you, Jessica. Today, I would like to talk about some of the ways we can use IPSCs in ion channel research and disease. So as mentioned, stem cells can be reprogrammed to a multitude of cells, providing incredible resource for research. With the right differentiation path, they can actually be induced to form excitable cells, such as neurons and cardiomyocytes. Hence, they can be a great alternative to hard to obtain primary neurons and cardiomyocytes. For example, once the stem cells mature to the target tissue, such as atrial or ventricular cells, standard analytical tools, which can sometimes be reserved for isolated primary myocytes can also be utilized here. So if your interests are the electrical activities of the cells, when the cells have reached a certain level of maturity, they can even produce full action potentials that can be recorded using standard elect electrophysiological tools, such as the patch clamp technique. So what is the patch clamp technique? The patch clamp technique is considered the best method or the gold standard in investigating single cell electrical activity. It involves making a recording electrode continuous with the inside of the cell and hence recording the electrical activity across the membrane in different conditions. It is well known to provide the highest quality data about the function of ion channels. So it is the go-to method for studying action potentials and ion channel activity in cells from different origins, including primary cells such as isolated cardiomyocytes or neurons, transfective recombinant cells such as HEC293 expressing ion channel targets, and now even stem cells differentiated into tissues natively expressing the target protein. So let's talk a little bit about action potentials and ion channels. Generally, the membrane lipid bilayer is impermeable to charged particles. In order to alter the membrane potential in any respect, transmembrane proteins known collectively as ion channels form an aqueous conduit for the charged particles to pass. Ion channels are actually ubiquitous in the membrane of all cells but are extremely important in excitable cells. In essence, ion channels and their ionic currents are the main originators of action potentials and the primary actors in excitability. This schematic to the right shows the role of different ion currents in the production of a cardiac action potential. They have gating mechanisms that are sensitive to different stimuli, such as membrane potential for voltage-gated channels or specific ligands for ligand-gated channels. They are quite selective to specific ions such as sodium, potassium, calcium, or chloride. Depolarization and repolarization of the membrane is contingent on a very delicate interplay between the inward or depolarizing currents and the outward or repolarizing currents. Hence, there's, there are complex gating mechanisms control the duration of the action potential. As a result, 
Any perturbation, namely in the repolarization phase, may cause a prolongation in that duration. Diseases that are caused by the dysfunction of ion channels are termed channelopathies. They are mostly inherited, but that could also be induced by drug interactions with specific channels. When inherited, they are attributed to specific gene mutations encoding ion channels, as the table to the right shows. So far, a variety of diseases, namely in the nervous and cardiac system, have been attributed to channelopathies. These include epileptic and ataxia syndromes in the brain and Brugada syndrome in the heart. Another very common channelopathy in the heart is long QT syndrome. Long QT syndrome is a serious, potentially life-threatening heart rhythm disorder. It is actually seen as a prolongation in the QT interval when doing EKG. If left untreated, it can lead to torsade du point that eventually can cause sudden cardiac death. In fact, it has been reported that three to 4,000 people in the U.S. die each year from long QT syndrome causes. At the cellular level, it can be recorded showing a prolonged extensional duration. This can sometimes lead to early after depolarization, or EAD, hence leading to dorsat de point. It is apparent that the repolarization of these cells is impaired. There are many classifications of long QT syndrome. The most common are long QT1 and long QT2. Both of these are actually mediated by the loss of function of KV channels in the heart. KV 7.1 that conduct the IKS current for long QT1 and KV 11.1, also known as HERG, that conducts the IKR current for long QT2. Some drugs, even such as cisapiride and terfenidine, have been shown to induce long QT2 by blocking HERG. Once these conditions were discovered, these drugs were removed from the US market. One of the great benefits of using IPSC to model diseases, and in this case, channelopathies, is that they can be derived from patient cells. This ability allows us to produce patient-specific stem cells that show the phenotypic characteristic of the disease. In this case, getting stem cells from low QT patients would differentiate to cardiomyocytes with long QT phenotype that would show a prolonged actual potential compared to control IPSC. This model will provide us with a path for disease modeling and patient specific cell therapy. In addition, with the creation of phenotype specific IPSC cell lines, the ability to do large scale drug screening with IPSC is possible. So although recombinant cell lines such as HEC293 transfected with specific ion channel targets are very popular in high throughput drug screens, a stem cell cell line with a specific disease phenotype may provide a better alternative for patient-specific or disease-specific pharmacotherapy. For example, in a study where they differentiated stem cells from a long QT1 patient, actual potential recordings clearly showed a prolongation in the actual potential duration compared to control. Considering this is a channelopathy correlated to the dysfunction in the action of KV1, which conduct the current IKS, they use whole cell patch clamp to confirm the lack of activity of the ion channel. Since IKR and IKS are quite difficult to isolate when expressed together in a stem cell, they use selective blockers of each channel and subtracted the resulting current. It was clear that IKS was dramatically diminished in this patient's cells compared to IKR. Further, uh, further providing proof that this is long QT1 patient and that the cells are showing the phenotype. In comparison, stem cells from another patient with long QT2 also showed a prolongation of the actual potential. The prolongation was seen in ventricular and atrial cells, but not much in nodal cells. Doing a similar electrophysiology experiment as before with a voltage clamp protocol combined with a selective blocker, it was apparent that IKR was severely decreased in these cells, denoting a dysfunction in KV11.1 or HERG ion channel. As basically as a note here, IKR or HERG current is difficult to see when the, when the channel activates due to a process called rectification. Hence, the best way to record its activity is to step the membrane to a positive potential, here plus 60, then stepping back to minus 30 millivolts. This will show the tail of the current and allows us to record it. You can see the difference in the current size, control, and log UT IPC. At comparison, you can see the tail of the overexpressed channels as reported in recombinant cells on ion flux. In this case, now that the phenotype-specific stem cells are obtained, the researchers attempted a few drug channel interactions to see if they can fix the APT duration problem. In here, they exposed the cells to calcium channel blockers. In the cases shown here, the APT duration decreased and the possibility of EAD disappeared. Although drug testing was limited here, 
The creation of these phenotypic stem cells show the possibility of using them in large-scale drug screens, targeting the activity of these dysfunctional ion channels. As mentioned before, among all of the analytical tools to study ion channels, manually performed patch clamp provides the highest amount of content with regard to understanding the function of these channels. However, with its dependence on highly skilled scientists and very low throughput, it became quite clear that it's not suitable for high throughput ion channel drug screens. So a high throughput alternative is required. Well, instead of looking at a different method, with the increase in popularity of planar patch clamp, automation of the patch clamp method became possible. In this approach, cells are put into suspension and brought into contact with a hole on the substrate, either at the bottom or to the side. Once the patch is formed, recordings are done in a similar way to manual patch clamp. Automated patch clamp systems, or APC, simplified and expanded ion channel recordings, allowing high throughput screening of drugs with quality of data approaching manual patch clamp fidelity. In most cases, recombinant cells are still used, providing a valid alternative to primary cells. However, recently, with the ability to create iPSC cell lines, using stem cells is becoming a much more viable alternative considering how close they are to physiological conditions. A next generation APC is ion flux from cell. Once more, before we continue the presentation, we would appreciate your responses to a short poll that will appear on screen. Please select the answer that is most relevant to you. Are you currently studying ion channels using A, manual patch clamp, B, automated patch clamp, C, I am not currently studying ion channels, or D, other electrophysiological techniques? Thank you for your responses. We will now continue with the presentation. This ion flux from cell microsystems. This microfluidics-based APT closely mimics manual patch clamp designs in a microfluidic environment, providing continuous flow of solutions, industry-leading liquid exchange, ease of use, and temperature control. Depending on configuration, it can record from 16, 64, or up to 256 wells at the same time providing the means to exponentially multiply the data points obtained within a specific period of time. Using pneumatically driven systems, all experiments are conducted with the plate proper, with interwell movements of solutions, cell trapping, and recording. Ion flux is widely used in many industry and academic labs for high throughput recordings of ligand gated and voltage gated ion channels. Here is an example of recordings from GABA-A receptors. These receptors conduct chloride and are the main inhibitory receptors in the brain. They are implicated in epilepsy, autism, sleep disorders, and alcoholism. To the right are recordings from different GABA-A receptors using recombinant cells and ion flux systems. With the increasing concentration of GABA, the currents became larger and faster with a distinct desensitization. Below is a GABA dose response curve for the various receptors presented. These channels can be modulated by substances known as positive allosteric modulators, or PAM. These substances can enhance the current under a constant concentration of GABA. Very common PAM for GABA is diazepam, which is marketed as Valium, alprozolam, which is Xanax, and zolpidem, which is Ambien. The traces to the right show how the currents increased when an increasing dose of diazepam was co-applied with one micromolar of GABA. Below are dose response curves denoting the potentiation of these receptors by the drug. Now, as mentioned before, stem cells can be differentiated into neurons that can natively express neuronal ion channels, including GABA receptors. So, in these experiments, commercially available neuronal iPSCs were used with the Unflux automated patch clamp to qualify their use in high throughput drug screening environment using patch clamp technique. The cells responded to increasing concentration of GABA in the same way as recombinant cells did. In addition, they showed similar potentiation when subjected to co-application of one micromolar GABA with an increasing concentration of diazepam. Hence, with these experiments, we can validate the use of iPSC with automated patch clamp systems instead of relying on the slow method of manual patch clamp, and can definitely show that they are a great alternative to recombinant cells in drug screening workflows. So in conclusion, Differentiated iPSCs into neurons or cardiomyocytes can provide a great baseline for ion channel drug discovery and screening using APC systems, 
and developing IPCs with specific channelopathies is a great potential source of phenotype-specific cell lines, also with great possibilities for drug discovery. Hello, and thanks for joining us today for the latest Technology Networks webinar, Development. Thank you very much to you both. I'm sure you will all agree that there were some excellent points raised during this presentation. Before we begin the Q&A session, we have one more question that we would appreciate your answer to. A poll will appear on the right-hand side of your screen. Please select the answer that is most relevant to you. Are you interested in learning more about the Ion Flux automated patch clamp system? A, yes, B, no. Thank you all for your responses. We will now begin the Q&A session. To submit a question to our speakers, you should enter your question into the box on the right-hand side of your screen and click send. We will endeavor to answer as many questions as possible during the time that we have available. We have already had several questions submitted, and so I will move straight on to these, starting with a question for Jessica. How many cell raft arrays are required for the reprogramming workflow? Thanks, Alex. That's a great question. Uh, it really depends on how many colonies you're hoping to derive. Uh, typically, one or, or two would be sufficient for most workflows. As you could tell from the presentation, you know, there are, are hundreds to thousands of foci that could be isolated individually. So that's typically far more than uh, most people would need to interrogate for downstream uh, workflows. But the nice thing about the system is that you can seed as many arrays as you like, and you can perform as many electroporations as you wish, because you can uh, run different experiments concurrently on the air system without monopolizing the instrument. Thank you. Um, and we have another cell raft question here. Do the cell raft arrays come pre-coated? Uh, they don't actually. Uh, we like to keep the platform fairly open source. So at the moment, the arrays do not come pre-coated and that leaves you able to coat them with whatever coating of choice might be useful for you. We have lots of coatings that we've pre-validated that we provide Intel on, uh, but at the moment they're, they're coated in the user's lab. Fantastic, thank you. Um, let's see more questions come in. Um, can you reprogram or differentiate in a single step on the cell raft array? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, it's a little bit depends on what you mean by a single step, um, but the answer in, in short is yes. Uh, so you can go directly from the electroporator right to uh, the cell raft array. You don't need to plate it in a six wall plate and then go on to the array if you don't want to. Um, so you can go right to that process um, from the electroporator onto the cell raft and then follow that automatic uh, imaging over the course of the time points before you do your isolation. So in the short word is yes. Um, the longer answer would be that um, a lot of those processes require different media changes, different steps, different amount of cells. So we'd probably recommend that you optimize your individual workflow so that you can optimize the seeding densities, the viability, the survival, et cetera, for each of those particular workflows. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, and one more question for you, actually. Does keeping stem cells in culture on the array until isolation really help improve clone development? Absolutely. We've seen this time and time again with every line that we've tried. Um, you know, the barrier that stem cells have to overcome for single cell cloning is far higher than your average CHO or HEC cell. And what we have seen uh, over and over again and what our customers have seen over and over again is that the ability to keep the cells on the array in media that's shared across thousands of cells really dramatically improves the ability of that single cell to form a colony and then ultimately survive after isolation and transfer. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, We've also had a few questions come in on the ion flux plates. Um, so a question for Ali. Um, can you grow stem cells on ion flux plates? Uh, in fact, actually, you cannot. Uh, stem cells have to be lifted in order to put into the ion flux plate. Um, this is sometimes we actually receive this question a lot of people try to actually grow on the plates themselves. You cannot do that. Um, 
but basically the 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 uh, the uh, the cells are lifted very gently and they're put into the plate and with a with, with a great survivability ratio fantastic thank you um another question for you um if we have an ion flux auto patch model optimized for hex cells could we use that for ipscs as you showed Yes, of course. Uh, it's the same system. It does not differentiate. Uh, it basically would work with any type of spherical cells, including iPSCs. Uh, once they're lifted, they become spherical. And uh, as long as you have the right concentration and the right assay, uh, it will patch them. It will record from them. No problem whatsoever. Excellent. Thank you. Um, we've had a couple of questions come in from this audience member. So if it's OK, I'll ask them all in quick succession. <laughs> um, the first being, what kind of model cells can be used with ion flux system? You can use, uh, like as I mentioned, you can use any type of spherical uh, cells, uh, from uh, recombinant cells to primary cells, for example, lymphocytes uh, to uh, stem cells. Uh, basically, any cells which are um, in great quantities, and you can put them in suspension. You can basically patch patch them on the ion flux system. Fantastic, thank you. Um, and if you're able to, could you provide any info around the success rate of the ion flux system? Right. So because recombinant cells are uh, used a lot, so we can guarantee basically with hex cells that you are going to be getting uh, between 70 to 95 percent success rate. 70 when your assays are not really very good and 95 when your assays are very good. In most cases, um, most of our customers, they get 90 and 95 percent success rate. With stem cells, the same thing. If you actually get your assays to be adjusted correctly, you will get between 70 to 90% success rate. Fantastic, thank you. Um, we still have time for a few more questions. So let me take a look at what's coming in. Can you recover the cells at the end of the ion channel experiments? Actually, the cells, which uh, so basically in 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 every experiment, the cell go from the in well to the out well, and some of them are patched, and the rest they actually go all the way to the out well. So the cells which are in the out well are actually still alive. The cells, of course, which are patched, you cannot recover them anymore. But the cells which are in the out well, which are the brethren of the cells which have been patched, they can definitely be recovered. So if you're doing some assessment on different cell types, you can definitely uh, patch some of them and then recover the rest. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, yes, another question. Can you exchange the intracellular solution? Uh, uh, no, you cannot. But the ion flux system is a pretty open system, meaning that the uh, locations for the intracellular wells is open. And therefore, at the same time and on the same plate, with the same experimental conditions, you can have multiple intracellular solutions running at the same time. So you can definitely do assessments of different intracellular uh, solutions uh, with the cells, but you cannot exchange the intracellular solution once the experiment starts. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I think we have time before one last, maybe two last questions. One last question. Um, can you change the temperature on the cells? Uh, yes, of course, uh, you can, you can definitely change the temperature. The ion flux system does come with temperature control built into it that goes from ambient to physiological temperatures. So very easily you can do experiments with physiological temperatures. Uh, you can even also get the optional, uh, cooling system that will allow you to actually cool the cells down and do experiments, uh, with cells, which have been cooled down to up to four degrees Celsius. Fantastic. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Hartman and Dr. Yehia. I'm afraid that is all we have time for today. Um, just to remind everybody that any questions we didn't have time to get to will be answered offline as soon as possible. And you can continue to ask questions even whilst watching this webinar on demand. A certificate of attendance is now available to download from the handouts tab on the right hand side of the webinar platform. And the webinar will now be made available on demand. If you have any friends or colleagues that you think may be interested in this webinar, please feel free to share the link. At the conclusion of this webinar, you will be directed to a short survey page. We would appreciate your responses here. And thank you again for your time. Thank you. Thank you.